What's going on, everyone? Super excited for you to hear today's episode with Will Aitken. If you've been in tech sales for a few years now, there's a good chance that you've seen Will or heard his name somewhere on LinkedIn. In the episode, we talk about Will's background in sales and how he actually made the transition from sales rep to content creator and eventually the head of content over at Lavender. We also talk about his advice for other sales reps that are interested in creating their own content. And towards the end, he actually broke news on reacquiring the sales feed brand from Vidyard. So that was pretty awesome. We got into a lot of other cool stuff. Uh, so super excited for you guys to hear this one. One last thing before we get started, if you're not already subscribed to the follow-up newsletter, what are you waiting for? Go over to jointhefollowup.com, sign up, put your email in there. We send you the best sales news, tips, entertainment every Tuesday and Thursday. Make sure you're signed up. And with that, let's get into the episode. All right, and we're live. So today's guest has 48,000 followers on LinkedIn, 41,000 on TikTok. He's very well known in the B2B sales world. Uh, he started his career in sales back in 2016. Uh, and while finding success in sales, he started sharing his sales content online, which he parlayed into running content at a few different popular software companies like Vidyard and Lavender. Um, he recently left his job as the head of content at Lavender to go full-time on his own brand, building his own business. And I'm pumped to talk to you about this today. Welcome to the show, Will. Uh, did I cover everything there? You hit it all, Nick. Thank you. You even got my follow account. You know it better than I do. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so uh, pumped to talk to you about this. I know you just left your job recently, so this is like a pretty interesting time, I think, to talk to you. Um, first off, though, I want to talk about your career just going through LinkedIn here and looking at like the different jobs that you've had, obviously you started in sales, then you sort of went into content. So how did that sort of happen? Can you walk me through like, you know, starting in sales and then, and then what that jump looked like? Yeah, for sure, mate. And it's an interesting one. So a lot of people are doing it these days. Uh, a lot of those folks who invest in like a personal brand find that, that passion for content creation. Um, but yeah, I was working as a software sales rep, account executive, closing deals, hitting to target, doing really well for myself. But I just moved to a new city in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I didn't really know anyone. I didn't have that many friends. I relocate a lot. I've moved from like UK to Australia to Canada to a different place in Canada. Um, so I was finding myself quite bored uh, when I was not working. And although I love sales, there's only so much you can really do um, before getting burnt out. So I started creating videos as a bit of a hobby and um, and having a blast doing it. I didn't really care about the performance of them, how they did, but just had fun like getting better on camera, learning new editing techniques, uh, putting them out there, and people started enjoying them as well. Uh, eventually, I was doing so well at product sales that I asked for a promotion, and I didn't get it um, for, I can't remember the reason, but like a spoiled toddler, uh, I took the first DM I got offering me an interview and it was for a content creation job. And at first I was like, ah, marketing, content creation. No, I enjoy video, but I don't want to do it full time as a job. Sales for life. And then um, the more I heard about it, the more I figured out it would basically be doing what I love doing, which was creating videos as a full time job. And from there, the rest is history. I took the role and, 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 and the content blew up even more. Um, at the time, I think when I took that job, I had like 6,000 followers. By the time I left, I was up at 30. And then uh, I went and did the same thing again for another company called Lavender, who uh, are quite well known in the sales tech space. Yeah, so that job I think you're referring to is going to content creator uh, or evangelist at Vidyard, which then I think turned into sales feed, right? Yeah. Um, two questions there. What is an evangelist, number one? And two, what exactly was sales feed? What exactly was sales feed? What is sales feed uh, is the real question. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so Vidyard started sales feed because a lot of companies in the space started seeing a trend of like companies acting more like media companies uh, and creating content that audiences actually enjoy and it's actually engaging and resonating and helpful for them rather than just the usual self-promotional stuff. Um, Vidyard took that to the next level by actually starting a full-on media company called sales feed. So they created that and the leader and um, the person behind that, Tyler Lassar, thought, to create great sales content, we need someone who understands sales. We need someone who is already creating content and gets what sales people want, who can resonate with the audience. So that's what I was as an evangelist. My group, my job was to create content and grow the brand and presence of sales feed online, uh, both through my own content, but also creating content for sales feed, their YouTube channel, 
um, the TikTok blew up. That's got like a hundred thousand followers on there, um, and and LinkedIn as well, of course. So that that was the idea, and I don't love the title evangelist, but it's like the only good name that people will come up with for this. I think evangelism is like just evangelizing a brand that you believe in, um, and that can be done as a full time role. But more recently, since I've been out on my own, I've found a few companies that I really do love, and I'm I'm working with them now uh, to kind of almost like a long-term sponsorship because I would already recommend those tools and pay for them. It almost makes sense that I use my audience to um, promote them. So I'm, I'm not going to be doing it for more than one company as part of my new endeavor. Gotcha. And does that work like an affiliate deal or is that more of like a, almost like retainer? Retainer. I ain't doing okay. it for free these days. I, <laughs> I've got bills to pay his kids to feed. So um, no, I don't. affiliate deal. There's, there's some, some of the contracts I've included affiliateness when it was brought up. Um, so paid for, for, for performance as well. But generally the value isn't just the audience I'm driving. I'm going to be delivering content for these companies that they can use uh, to grow their own brands. So there's, there's actual physical deliverables, not just traffic. So mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, so when you're at sales feed and then obviously you jumped over to lavender so you're head of content at sales feed and then you were head of social at lavender i imagine very similar right just different um endings on the title there um what exactly does that entail is that like a certain amount of deliverables all the time are you actually sort of kpi'd on like the amount of leads you send over is there what type of measurements go into that yeah a lot of the measurements for both roles i had to set up for myself because this is a generally quite new concept things i was measuring classic impression follower growth um, views engagement uh, but also traffic as well from social channels so at lavender for example uh, an average week we've been sending about a thousand clicks from our linkedin page through to our website um you know you can we do a lot of link tracking these days on tiktok we we had some virality and we'd see you know upwards of we had something really pop off, like you could see like 5,000 clicks through the website. For a company like Vidyard, SalesFeed, Lavender, which have like newsletters, free products, free trials, um, a lot of those people who go through the website do end up signing up. Uh, and the idea is that when those folks sign up, they either convert to a paid user, or we use that as a trigger or a lead indicator to then go and prospect that company themselves. Um, so that's the ROI circle of the whole thing. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was just trying to, I knew I to grow on any channel, you had to hit X amount of posts. Um, so I was, you know, on average posting about twice a day on LinkedIn for Lavender, twice for myself, um, one TikTok a day, uh, two long form YouTube videos a week. Um, it, it was really like a very well-paid social media manager. The difference is that most social media managers don't have subject matter expertise. so. The content isn't as as tactical and helpful so i could go ahead and make a youtube video on how to write a cold email and i wouldn't have to rely on any experts or outside sources i just know that so it's just a case of me coming through delivering on that uh potentially editing it although i did get myself an editor at, at one point because the editing is so time consuming yeah. um uh so yeah you know about the podcast so um yeah it was just mainly making sure that we were always putting out new innovative helpful or entertaining content every single day, every single week. So I think it's like no question that a lot of brands are moving this way, right? Like uh, with HubSpot, they acquired the hustle because obviously that's just like a massive traffic source, right? <clears throat> and, you know, I think there's a lot more, uh, who was it? I think Outreach acquired Sales Hacker. I think they just sold it recently. Uh, but clearly so like, think, yeah. was that? They actually sold it back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I they did. acquired it back, which actually in my head says that like it wasn't super successful for outreach right I, I think there's probably different ways to look at it um my question there though is that obviously like there's a ton of value in having it but do you think every brand should have it and is every brand going to be successful with it because it seems like there's so many different factors uh hell no yeah heck no um i don't i, don't, I, I mean I've, I've questioned the value of it myself sometimes. Um, and that's when I'm about to step up and get creative on how I'm gonna track it. So that's why I started tracking things like page conversions and making sure that all of our forms for a demo request had a field, where did you hear about us? And what we wanna see is LinkedIn, YouTube, Will Aiken, um, and, and that happened, right? Now, not every company, one, has the talent internally to make that happen as well in the thought process. In my mind, 
a much better approach is to still to do that, but combine it with actual more traditional sales methods. So if you really wanna see ROI from something like this, like let's say I post a video on how to cold email and it gets 500 likes. 500 likes, woo, but what, what does that mean for the company? Well, we saw uh, upticking people clicking through to the website and downloading the tool at that time. But there's also a, a motion for like every single one of those 500 people is now some form of intent lead for us as well. So then it's a case of figuring out, okay, of those 500 people, how many people are in our ICP? How many people are decision makers who can immediately prospect and know that those folks are gonna be more familiar with us and therefore more uh, receptive to direct outreach from our sales team? If they're not a decision maker, can we start seeing trends where like three reps from Oracle or SAP are engaging with our content and then take that information to one of their leaders and use that as an intent trigger and say, hey, listen, your team have been engaging with our content. That tells us they might be looking to improve their cold email game. Have you ever considered a tool like Lavender that's actually gonna help them write emails while they're in their inbox? Like that, that's a motion. I think that's a much more successful motion than just like, oh, we'll make content and hope for the best. It does take a lot of thought and it's not easy to make content that resonates. Otherwise everyone would do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to do so, you do have to have the right people behind it. I'm not trying to float my own boat here, but I've been doing this for long enough now. It's kind of almost intuition of like, I know what works and what doesn't. I also, as I mentioned, I've been in sales, right? So the content I make is actually helpful stuff that I know I would have enjoyed to see as a sales rep and finding someone who can both speak to the topics, make relatable, entertaining content, who has that kind of quirky nature to them, but also is willing to be a content creator. Um, it's, a, it's a rare mix. Um, so I think you have to have the right people and the right thought behind the strategy as well, rather than aimlessly thinking, okay, well, let's just, become a media company and hope for the best. You got to really think those things out. Yeah, totally. I think what you just said about intent was super interesting, right? Because I think there's kind of controversy out there whether intent data is real, right? Like uh, these different companies like Zoom Info and whatnot sell intent data, right? They're like, oh, these people are searching for it or whatnot. But what you just said about, you know, your team is engaging with our content that has to do with this. That's like a, a door opener, right? It, that's relayed to the sales team. Is that a lot of what you did? Yeah, exactly. And there are tools that can help you do that in a less manual way. I'm not suggesting that SDR should be sitting there scrolling through the, the likes and comments and engagements on their team's LinkedIn profile. I had software that would say, okay, of all the people who are in your measured community, here are the folks who engage you the most. Here are the main companies that are engaging with your content. Here are the, like, the people who match your ideal custom profile, title, company size, sales team size. And that would then allow me to say, okay, let's pro I'll, I'll shit those over to the sales team. You've got to hit this guy up. He's engaged with our content. He's not a customer. Um, he's going to know about us. Am I going to say, hey, bud, seeing you've been engaged with our content, do you want a demo? No, it's I'm still going to prospect them with, with thought, personalization, um, relevance. But just knowing that they're probably more familiar with our brand, they're going to be much more receptive to said outreach. Um, and that's that's where I think it's like a marketing sales alignment, which most companies just totally don't have because the sales team thinks the marketing teams work and the marketing team thinks the sales team don't wanna, don't believe in their work. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much every work that I've ever been at. I'm pretty sure anyone that's been in sales has, has uh, experienced that. Um, okay, I wanna switch things up a little bit here. So you recently left your job, which I can yep. um, appreciate because I did too. It's a little bit scary, right? You have a family, you have a wife and two kids, a mortgage. Can you tell me about that decision and how you how you made the job? Yeah, so it's something that I knew I wanted to do for a long time. Like, I've obviously got a kind of knack for growing an audience and I'd never really monetized that outside of working as a content creator for these companies. But I've seen like a lot of these larger thought leaders, sales trainers, creators monetize that really well. But I'd always been pointing towards something else not myself so to do that i knew i had to have something i could monetize um so before i made that decision i i wanted to make sure i had something to point back towards in this case i've got a course now which is like a self-paced kind of um, prospecting course for sales reps i'm creating two more one on content creation for marketers or sales reps looking to do the same thing i've done and one on more like discovery demo presentation closing um I also wanted to make sure I had a couple of brand deals lined up, the ones I mentioned about the evangelism, because stepping into the void with no money, the main reason that people fail when they start businesses is because they just got no runway. Um, so by having my 
my existing income that I was getting paid as an employee covered by what I had lined up, I then had that confidence to say, okay, now's the time I'm going to do it. Um, so it's a little bit less scary. Uh, still is though, because people don't always pay their invoices on time. And I know that, you know, these contracts, they might not renew and I'm always going to have to have something lined up. But so far things have been going really well, exceeded my expectations. So. Do you, and this kind of plays back even at your time at these different companies, right? But all of your content is around B2B sales for the most part, right? Do you ever worry that now that you're not sort of in the weeds selling, but like giving advice, Get basically? Get out of my head, Nick. Yeah, I just... You, you're, describing my, you're describing my imposter syndrome, um, mate. Um, I d definitely a big concern. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. I don't want to come out of touch. I don't want to be one of those people who's just like out of touch. You're like I've had sales trainers, and sales leaders who have never closed deals or haven't closed a deal in 10 years. And it, like, you get rusty. You, you, you get disconnected and... Um, less tactical as time goes on and like things do change in sales like you know five years ago the way that people bought was very different to now and now it's like half of their process is without the sales rep they come with a bunch of information and they know everything before you even start talking to them um to, to combat that because as i said imposter syndrome and i don't want to be an out of touch sales guru um I've been involving myself more in sales. Uh, I've, I've been, it's it's very easy to get involved in prospecting because I can just uh, get basically work for a company and do a hundred cold calls for them. And I, I, I want to make content around that as well because it's a double, double edged sword. One, it allows me to actually show, not tell. But two, it allows me to feel like glass of imposter. The hardest stuff to, to emulate is like, what's it like to sell a software? If I'm not selling something with discovery and demos on a daily basis, then how can I say what I'm teaching is is worthwhile? In those cases, I have to just trust that being a business owner and closing my own deals and following my own teachings is is enough. Um, but also, I've, I've made sure over the past couple of years that I've become a bit more of a student of sales as well. So I'm always trying to learn and talk to people and read books and listen to podcasts so I can stay up to date and, and make sure I'm not uh, jaded in, in what I'm what I'm talking about, stuff I believe in remembering what worked for me but also then still applying new things where i can in my own life uh, and my own sales cycles with my business yeah i think it's a tough one and and me personally even writing like the newsletter uh which which i write all about b2b sales right which i don't know about you but coming up with new content in b2b sales the you know riveting industry it is can sometimes be tough right because like how many times can you talk about cold calling and cold emailing and prospecting what is your process for that? And how do, you, how do you think about coming up with new ideas? It's a good question. We could do a whole hour on this, I think. But um, I, I, there's the consuming content's really important for me. So looking at other people's perspectives, I don't agree with everyone, but I'm not going to go out and like disagree with them. But it's like hearing other people's perspectives. Um, I do a lot of one to one coaching now of sales reps as well hearing what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're constantly giving me ideas, asking questions they haven't heard before, that I haven't spoken about before. They're like, Will, um, my, uh, uh, like they'll tell me about a bit part of their process that feels broken and then I can work through that and that gives me ideas. People comment questions, ask me questions all the time on videos, on YouTube. Um, a lot of the content I make isn't always super educational, so I can look for inspiration in for entertaining content in more mainstream media looking outside the world of sales to see what other people are doing. If you just go on TikTok, for example, search hashtag tech sales and then sort by most popular, you'd start to see what other people are talking about. If they, if your opinions or perspectives differ from theirs, then that's a great opportunity to go and make content that you believe you have a unique perspective to share on as well. Um, but I think the most important thing is to always be consuming. Journaling is really big for me as well. So when I'm coaching someone or talking to a customer and I hear something, or get an idea or, or hear a challenge that I haven't heard before, I'll write that down. That gives me time to then come back to those, think them out, um, fuel the content a bit more. Uh, finally, I'd say just, you can still use the same ideas, the same teachings in different formats. I make video content, I make memes, I make images, I make templates, I make uh, written posts on LinkedIn and stuff like that. So there's always new ways to recycle the same ideas in a way that people haven't consumed before and make them uh, interesting. I think there's uh, something to be said for not just unique ideas, but unique delivery. So that's where I can focus most of my energy. And and I don't think you said it there. You said 
you do a lot of consuming, but also I think that a lot of people get trapped in the circle of consuming. It's consuming and not actually putting anything out there, right? It's probably yeah. the biggest thing, right? But you don't do that. No, you get, it's practice as well, right? Like it's a muscle, I think, in my opinion. The more you do it, the more the more you get better at, cut. the more ideas you come up with, the better I, the more, the better you get up at coming up with ideas, right? And you get, you, there's live feedback online as well. Most social media, you put something out, it flops, you know that idea wasn't any good, right? But if, if you put something out and it's great and people love it and they're like, more, well, that then fuels you to say, okay, what else can I say on this topic, on this matter, on this problem, this challenge that people are having? And that, that only helps you more. Yeah, and so switching up a little bit here, if someone is, and I think it's happening more and more, I think you mentioned it already, uh, where salespeople, marketing people, anyone in corporate America, right, is like, oh, it's kind of interesting to do this content thing. And obviously there's the headlines of, you know, content creators making millions of dollars. And those are a bit misleading because that's like the top, you know, 0.5% that are actually doing that. that yeah. But what's, and, and this is a bad question just off the basis of what's your advice for people wanting to do that? But what are like the first, you know, one to three steps you'd say, first off, if someone should even do that, and then if they're going to, what they should do? Um, if you listen to any of those interviews of like from the big content creators, with a few exceptions, none of them were like, I'm going to be someone with a hundred million YouTube subscribers or something like that, right? I think Mr. Beast was pretty intentional about what his goals were. He's like, I, I made a video like five years ago, like if I'm not at a hundred million subscribers by this date, I'm gonna quit or whatever. Like, but I think the most important thing is if you're gonna do that, make sure it's something you actually enjoy. Like it's, it, if you spend your time chasing something or focusing on it for the wrong reasons, I think you are gonna get burned out. You're gonna get frustrated at the lack of results because it does take a long time to, to build something like this up and get good at it. Um, so one, make sure it's something that you actually want to do for the right reasons. If you want to say, oh, I want to go and make a LinkedIn post because I want 10 inbound leads every day. That's just not realistic. Do it because you want to do it. You want to share, you enjoy it. It's something that's not going to take more away from your energy levels. It's something that's going to fill you up. Um, the second thing is to probably go out there and, and consume that. Like I mentioned, again, it's so important. Find people in your space who are already doing what you want to do. People you want to aspire to be like, or or, or, or inspiration or be, folks whose content you can read to get an understanding of what people want and what people are engaging with already, because that's only gonna help you focus on doing the right things. So if you wanna go out there and be a big YouTuber who's gaming or, I don't know, talking about sales, go and find the biggest sales YouTubers, watch them, listen to them, be intentional about how you consume it as well. Don't just watch it aimlessly like it's a, you know, what you do on the couch at night with your, your family, just like chilling out. Like, think about it like, okay, what did they do there? How do they do that? A lot of the stuff that I've found works really well for me is like little pieces. So like when I'm editing a video, if you watch a Mr. Beast video, who's obviously like a great example of someone who's clearly doing something, right? He has all these like fast paced cuts and editors and whooshes and stuff. I'm like, oh, that clearly keeps me engaged because I realized, oh, this video makes me feel like I'm getting whiplash. It's that fast. Can I apply that to my sales videos? Like do that so you can like learn how to get good and not just through trial and error, like, take some shortcuts by what see, seeing someone who's doing it really well and using them even in, in the, like a, if you, if you want to start a podcast, go listen to the, the best podcast in the world, the most listened to ones, even if it's freaking Joe Rogan or something like that, because obviously he's doing something right. What can you take to apply, even though your podcast might have nothing to do with um, what he talks about conspiracies and whatnot. Um, and then uh, I'd say the last piece of advice is just, um, just do it. Uh, and know that it's it's going to start and you're going to get two likes on a LinkedIn post and no one's going to watch a YouTube video, but uh, practice makes perfect. You're going to build that muscle. My first video was trash. It's uh, I left it up. I thought about deleting it, but I just thought, you know, it's good to see people. I wasn't just didn't just turn it on one day and suddenly, bang, I'm making these productions that everyone thinks are hilarious and funny. It's awkward as heck. Like the cuts are bad. My delivery is bad. I'm stiff. It's like, Oh, it makes me cringe just thinking about it. It's still up there. You can go find it if you want. But uh, I only got good by just doing the same thing over and over again. Same as any skill. Same as cold calling. Same as sales. Same as going for a run or going to the gym. You're going to get good by just doing it. And sadly, that's just part of uh, learning any skill. It totally is. I mean, even just looking at directly into a camera and talking, like the first 10 times I did it, your mind just goes blank as soon as you look into that lens, right? You're just like, 
you get nerves. <laughs> like, like, I forgot everything that I was just going to talk about, and it's all gone. And now all I can think about is like, what am I supposed to do? Yes. It, yeah. Exactly. It's you know, heck, even I still hate some of the stuff I make. I'm like, oh, what? you know, you never get comfortable, especially with camera and video, because hearing your own voice is just so unnatural. But yeah, you just got to keep doing it. And then uh, it becomes an intuition. And when it's an intuition, you can really start to hone in on like the, the nitty gritty to up that, that next level. Yeah. So uh, first episode I ever did uh, with this podcast, I interviewed Trent Dressel, uh, if you're familiar yeah. with him. Um, yeah, Trent, yeah. And so he... I'll see him next week, actually, in Florida. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Tell him I said hi. And so he has, I want to say, 30, 40,000 subscribers on YouTube, which YouTube is very tough to grow on, right? But... During COVID, I think he put out like a video a day, which is insane, right? That's like so much work. But he basically said, hey, look, I'm going to brute force myself into this. Uh, I'm going to yeah. just put something out every single day, no matter what. Um, and it worked for him, right? But one thing when I was talking to him was that, you know, he was at, his niche is similar to yours, right? It's basically tech sales, which like I was saying, there's only so many things you can really talk about. And there's not as broad of an audience. It's like there's only, you know, a specific amount of people, very valuable audience, but very small audience. And he was kind of saying, I'm very happy that I went this route and am in the B2B sales niche. Um, however, like sometimes it is a little bit uh, tough looking at these other creators that go more broad and go viral and things like that. However, his payouts are much better, right? So like his CPMs on a video could be like $20 where if, you know, you're uh, filling a pool with like Zorbies or whatnot, you're going to get like a dollar per CPM or something. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever deal with that? Um, to your question earlier, you said something about, hey, Will, you've been out of sales for a couple of years now it would be easy for me to just not talk about sales anymore, right? Like, it would be easy for me to make a, make my niche content creation, let's say. I'm clearly quite good at that. I have a lot to say on the topic. But um, that doesn't interest me as much as sales. And I think the interest has to be there for you to come through on it. I, I've experimented. I'm gonna probably do a bit more of it and let them all my personal stuff. I think someone who does this quite well, like Vin Matano, who's another guy who's kind of coming up in the sales content creation world. He kind of combines sales and lifestyle a little bit more. So it's like vlogs and everything like that. Um, but I, I'm passionate about what I talk about and that, that comes through in the content, I think. Uh, at least I hope. Um, I play video games, I make Legos. I could make a Lego YouTube channel or a video YouTube channel and use all the editing and filming and equipment skills to do that, but it wouldn't be as fulfilling for me. Also, the fact that I make sales content gets me other opportunities. Like I get paid 15 grand for a keynote at a sales kickoff, right? And if I filled a pool full of Orbeez, I just don't think it's, I mean, like Mark Rober probably does get, you know, serious to speaking gigs right now, but like in a way there's even more competition in those mainstream things because everyone's trying to be a, a mainstream next Mr. Beast. Whereas there's very few in relatively very few people in B2B sales who want to go on YouTube. And I think that's why Trent's done well as well. Like if you go on YouTube and you search for sales advice, a lot of it's from like very like toxic sales gurus who are well known to be like those like classic, like, Grant Cardone's of the world and like whatnot. And he's filling a gap of like, oh no, solution sales and tech is like a real cool niche industry. And um, in a way that's that's probably his competitive differentiator. So um, yes and no, I do think about it. And if I have passion for something, I made a video recently about me making a wood table just because I was I wanted to make a table and I thought I've got a camera, may as well film the, the thing, but um, as I said, I'm not going to become a content guru anytime soon. I, I'm still, I still love talking about sales and helping people with it. And uh, that's, that's what keeps me going because it's easy to get burnt out when you're making these things as well. Yeah, totally. And I think uh, a massive part of that also is just focus, right? Like you focus strictly on, on making this type of content. Same with Trent. He said, you know, I'm going to put out a hundred videos on this content. Right. But if he switched up and said, well, maybe I'll do a little bit of lifestyle stuff or maybe I'll talk about, uh, you know, working out or whatnot. It's fun, yeah. but it does take a little bit of away from the focus of like, hey, I'm going to make this work. Do you think that's 
part of it as well? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. It helps to have a niche and know what you want to talk about. Otherwise, it's just like random acts of whatever. And also, like, generally, these a lot of these algorithms, they kind of punish you for, for doing other stuff as well. Like, um, I'd rather be the, the one of the top five people on this topic than one of the top 1,000 on everything. You know what I mean? It's It's almost better to be focused and it helps with content in a way coming with ideas being getting better like i i I'd honestly argue i know a lot more about sales in the past two years talking to doing podcasts bringing people into my podcast talking to sales trainers i've had like free training basically because i've worked with some of the best sales trainers on the planet um some authors who i absolutely love have now given me like half an hour of their time to talk about whatever and i've managed to get basically free training from them you know what i mean like i know more about sales maybe not in as much of a actionable doing it day-to-day sense but um i know a lot more about the topic now than i did two years ago heck i'd sometimes think like wow i'd love to go back and apply some of this stuff which is why i want to do more of the live cold calling and emailing stuff and show not tell because i also recognize that there are a lot of folks out there who who talk about stuff who don't know what the hell they're talking about as well and i want to make sure i don't fall into that trap totally and i think it probably opened up your mind of like what's even out there right because when you first get into sales and you're selling one product you're like everyone probably has these same exact issues, right? But everyone's selling to a different person and it's completely different, right? Like I was emailing with someone the other day that sells sponsorships on the side of NASCAR cars. I'm like, that is awesome. Like imagine being a sales rep that sells like, you know, I don't even know what that is. Is that six or seven figure deals for like getting a logo on the side of a NASCAR? Like that, that is awesome, right? And you've probably seen a lot of that with talking to to so many different people. Yeah. I mean, definitely when, especially when you're coaching with sellers as well, you, you get exposed. I didn't, I didn't think I'd like coaching that much because I just I never wanted to be a leader of any kind. But since doing coaching, since I launched this, I've had like probably 10 students, some one session, some five. Um, they have been, it's been really fascinating to one, see the differences, but also the similarities, like in that everyone, there's a lot of the same problems, even though people are selling vastly different products, like someone selling LinkedIn ad um, agency and another person selling like, this like deep enterprise analytics tool that brands like, um, you know, uh, American Airlines use to track passenger and and, um, customer loyalty. And and you suddenly realize these two people are facing the same issue and it's almost the same solution as well. There's obviously nuances to their their personas, but um, you do start to suddenly realize what what applies to everyone as well. The the macro similarities as well as the, the individual. But the nuance is good to know as well. That that and the money, right? When you hear about what some of these industries make or like what some of these sales reps can make at different companies is like, oh my gosh, now I know I would never want to sell this type of software, but I would want to sell exactly this stuff, right? That's so true as well. And I, I try not to talk about things that I haven't done as well. So I'm not going to go out on LinkedIn and start giving management tips because as I said, I've never been a manager. I'm also not going to give enterprise sales tips because I've never sold an enterprise sales. I've only sold mid-market. My biggest deal ever was like 120k right so like like and and in sales i loved like the really transactional like lots of quick wins that felt really good but when i talk to a seller who's got like a longer sales cycle he's got six months I'm like oh, i couldn't do what you do but it doesn't mean i can't help them in certain ways but yeah on one end it's like oh i couldn't do what you do but then when that one commission check is like 90 grand and it's like well maybe yeah. i could do a little bit of what you do that doesn't sound so bad <laughs> yeah coming around to it so yeah. Um, getting back to, I know we've, we've talked a lot about like content and media and stuff like that. I do want to talk a little bit about sales, right? Because that is one of your core offerings right now, right? Which is uh, like coaching and a course. Uh, and I think your specialty is sort of in like outbounded prospecting. Do I have that right? Um, for now, um, I mean, it's, 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 it was the easiest thing to start with, um, because I mean, I, I, I am working on some more um, strategic things. One, there's less nuance. Um, although enterprise prospecting is a little bit different uh, because you're gonna often do a lot more like research, deep seated research, maybe a bottom down approach, you might include some of that. It's a lot more broad. So the ideas do carry across to a much wider audience. Um, the second thing is just talking about discovery, demo, presentation, negotiation. There's a lot more if then buts, you know what I mean? So like. I can say generally this is the way to approach a cold call 
if I say this is the way to approach discovery, there's so many more variables. So it's a lot of more of a beefy topic to approach. So I started with prospecting to knock it off. I just know that discovery is going to be a big, bigger beast to, to put something together for and help people with. And there's going to be a lot more nuance and it's going to be a much smaller audience because like I said, I wouldn't want to sell discovery training to someone who's doing massive fortune 100 enterprise sales, closing those deals because I just won't be able to help them. Right. Um, so yes and no. Um, I'm going to be working a lot more discovery presentation, deal cycle management stuff soon. So almost like the Alator Mosey approach then, right? You, you put out the offers and then you're going to do the leads and then you'll do, you'll do the end. Uh, when that time yeah, goes, maybe. Exactly. <laughs> I just couldn't, there's, I tried to, to, to create something for, so what, what I did was I kind of just said, oh, what do I know? And I wrote it all down and I was like, oh my gosh, this is 30,000 words on every single aspect of outbound prospecting. This is like a, a book, a course. So then I was like, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to just get it out there and then I can have something to sell. And I'm now, I'm now having someone edit it into a book as well. Um, I did the same thing for Discovery and Demos and it's at 30,000 words already and it's not anywhere near done. It's just a bigger fish to try and tackle. It's a more complex idea uh, framework. And I also read it and I realized a lot of it wasn't mine. You know what I mean? I have to be careful of that because a lot of it is based on, you know, my favorite sales book. Uh, like I found, I was like, shit, I'm just selling gap selling. I can't go ahead and do that. I'm going to get fucking yeah, sued by Keenan. Yeah, Keenan is going to be you know? pissed. <laughs> He's going to be pissed. He's going to be like, what the fuck, Will? You're not even at least <laughs> licensed uh, gap selling before you go and sell it, you bastard. So so I don't, I want to do that. If I'm going to do that and get more into that, I want to make sure I have a unique pr point of view on it as well. And I do have one. Um, I, I, I believe there's a lot of, but I, I don't have it. I need to give it a lot more thought. And in that sense, maybe it's a bit of imposter syndrome because it's been a while. But I want to work with probably someone else to 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 help me iron it out to a full uh, framework, idea, methodology before I go ahead and try and sell gap selling in a course. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I, even, even if it's not Keenan, it might be some like like I realize, oh shit, this is this is a San Lapain funnel. I can't fucking say this is my idea and sell it. Whereas a lot of the cold call and cold email stuff, I do. I have I, 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 a lot of that whilst some of it is inspired in the conversations that I've had with, with great people. It's a point of view that I've formed based on a wide range of information. So it's, it's unique. That's what, and, and that's why I want to avoid being in the, in the, in the camp of like copying or stealing content or ideas. I get what you say about that and like the imposter syndrome part, but I was actually talking to someone about this yesterday. And if you really zoom out and look at like the big business influencers, let's think like, you know, Hormozy, Cardone, any, any of those guys, if you really look at it, most of their content is just repackaging stuff that they read or that an influencer before them put out. Most of those ideas they got from somewhere else. They're not, everyone has like one or two maybe original ideas. The rest is just stuff that they read and they're repackaging. That's that's very true as well. And I mean, I, I heard this a quote, uh, there's no such thing as an original uh, idea anymore like there's like an idea that everything we've ever thought of is nothing's original anymore and um i don't disagree with that i sorry i was trying to pull up i i made a meme earlier about this uh because i'm actually reacquiring the sales beat brand uh to be mine now really um yeah yeah so i'm very excited for that because that's got ten thousand subscribers on youtube which makes it quite a big b2b sales <laughs> youtube channel when we talk about folks like trent as well so it's great to have that back and be able to focus on that as a side thing that I can do. Okay. But um, I made a meme about this earlier. It's like, it's like the, uh, you know, the astronaut meme where he's like, hang on, it's yeah. all this. And he's like, it always has been. It's like all LinkedIn advice is some variation of like spin selling or Sandler. You know, like it all comes back. Like there's some nuance there. The delivery is different. So people have their own like tweaks of it, but it always is very similar when it comes to like solution selling. Find the problem, sell the solution. It all kind of sounds the same at the end when you really boil it down to the core ideas. Yeah. And even Sandler and spin selling, right? Those are just like people packaging what they probably learned when they were selling, you know, uh, from their sales trainer. And who, right? and who taught them, yeah. right? Where did that come from? Exactly. Their sales manager probably taught to them. So is it even theirs? Yeah. So there's a lot of that, yeah. So can we talk about sales feed? Because I, yeah. I got the last email from them, I think their last newsletter of... 2023 in December and oh, I, you, were, you were a subscriber I was a subscriber well I'm in the I'm in the uh you know sales newsletter world and it's really sales feed 
And there's one other that I won't mention because they're pretty similar. Um, but those are like the only ones, right? Yeah, that's so good. Huh? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a Reddit competitor, I, 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 especially in the world of like media. People can like more than one LinkedIn influencer and one YouTube channel, you know? Well, I, could, so, I consider I, them a competitor, um, even though they know, probably I, don't I, consider me a competitor. I don't even sell anything through Salesbeat. <laughs> Salesbeat isn't commercialized in any way, so that's, a, that's the one thing. Yeah, so I guess um, what's going on with that? So I saw at the end of 2023, they sent out an email and said, like, this is going to be the last one. We're going to switch things up in the new year. And then I think it was redirecting to like a personal site for like the marketing director yeah. or something. So Tyler's side is the VP of marketing at Vidyard. He's the one who started sales speed. He's the one who hired me as the evangelist to come and build out the content and the YouTube and the newsletter and the TikTok and all that stuff. Because um, Vidyard um, had some restructuring, it meant that that team wouldn't really be able to su uh, be sufficient. Uh, so keep, keep it alive enough, right? So the CEO said to Tyler, do you, do you want to take it and, um, and, and and make sure it stay, keeps going? And he said, yeah. And then he came to me and said, well, like, obviously half of the stuff we built here was you. I'd love for you to come back. So we, we, we joined, joined together again as a partnership. So uh, now it's uh, its own thing, separate from the Vidyard brand. And um, yeah, that's We've got some good plans for it. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you, so I'm super curious, um, like how not monetization, but like basically how it's funded. So basically Vidyard kind of just foots the bill for it. Is that correct? Could, the reason I say that is because like, like with HubSpot, right? When they acquired the hustle, they're not running ads in anymore, which is like their main revenue driver. And so they're basically saying, hey, we just want to own those ads, right? And that's kind of what SalesFeed yeah. does with Vidyard, right? So is that like the primary goal of just like driving leads obviously to Vidyard or is there bigger plans in the future for other brands? That was the goal, but now we own it, so it's not part of Vidyard anymore. Okay. Um, so, so right now the plans are whatever we decide to do with it. Uh, at, we, at, we, at this point, it's uh, AdSense from YouTube. Uh, about uh, we got a pretty good C CPM on that. Um, some of the videos have gone real viral as well, so they just keep keep paying. Um, but we're trying to figure out what we want to do with it. We could we could you know work with sponsorships, I suppose, but. Even then, like I still have a full time gig and I make enough money myself um, doing my channels. So in a way, it's like, well, in five years, if it's eight times or ten times or fifty times the size it is now, then heck, does HubSpot want that as well? And then it's a big payout, right? But for the meantime, I just I just love that audience. I love building for it. I love making content for it. I missed it when I left it. Uh, it felt like it was an extension to myself and now I'm just happy to have it back and be able to create content for a YouTube channel where people are actually paying attention again. Because uh, <laughs> my own one, although I, I launched my own channel, I, I, it, it, it's, it's got like 300 subscribers. Why start again if I already have that, that sales feed audience there who already know me and I know I enjoy the types of content that I create as well. So it's just a new way to, um, for a new place for me to put my stuff. Yeah, that's exciting. So YouTube's probably going to be the main focus for that, or are you you trying to grow the newsletter and everything as well? Um, the newsletter we'll have to because the the newsletter we ended it the newsletter because there will be some complications about how who owns that list. You know what I mean? Like a lot of those people sub technically subscribe to Vidyard, not Salesfeed. So that 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 was one thing. So we'll probably get the newsletter start up again. Um, it's just about how do we have time? Are we going to have enough to put in it? What, what's it going to look like? So that, that's still up in the air of how we could plan to do that. Um, but we want to wait till we announce things before we uh, go anywhere with that. But I assume this podcast won't be out, but uh, we'll be out after that. So yeah, when is that? Fun. So I can make sure. <laughs> um, it should have been this week, but it's probably looking like next week now, if not the week after. Okay. Well, let me know and I can hold off till then. Uh, I will. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to we'll see you uh, um, Yeah. Well, we just took a little sidetrack there. I do want to talk about sales uh, before we end here. Um, so with outbounding, right. And you built a course around it. Can you walk me through, like if someone were to start in a BDR role, let's say today, maybe they have a little bit of sales experience. Maybe they don't. Yeah. What, how would you structure or what would you do in your first, you know, weeks, days, months to like get ahead now, knowing everything that, you know, for obviously building yeah. content and, and, you know, being in the sales role for so long. Uh, yeah, good question. So high level, straight away. Um, most SDRs I speak to are like, I need product training. Fuck the product. Sorry, can I swear? 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't care. Fuck the product. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, you got to like immediately know like if you want to get interest from cold buyers who aren't already interested in your product, you can't talk about the product. They don't care. They didn't ask. They're not looking for it. Then chances are they're not looking for it, especially in this freaking economy. So instead, what you got to focus on is the problems, the challenges that could be going wrong with that company today that your solution is going to be able to help them solve. That's how you're going to get them interested by talking about those problems, focusing on those in your outbound, in your cold calls. You're asking questions to uncover those problems. In your emails, you're hypothesizing potential problems. Um, so you've got to have a really good idea of the problems that your product is going to help people solve, why those problems happen, what they're doing to uh, today to prevent those problems or what's not working today that's causing those problems, uh, other solutions that they may use, what's bad with those, what's good with those. The best place to do that if you work for a, a, a kind of established company, jump in the CRM, look at your case studies. Like you're gonna be looking for the, like, what was wrong before someone bought your product? What was the thing that happened that made them realize they needed your product? You gotta look for those symptoms of the illness, let's say that you solve. And this draws a little parallels from like gap selling, but it's a little bit more top of funnel, which King doesn't really talk about as much. It's the ways that those problems show themselves is gonna be your targeting, uh, guide it's going to be your map to figure out new people analogy i love to use is like imagine you're a doctor your job is to cure liver disease you're a doctor that specializes in liver disease let's say in this case you're a doctor who you're a sales rep who specializes in solving other disease your software is the medication the the treatment let's say if a doctor is uh, is specializing in uh, curing liver disease, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to look for the folks who are most likely to be facing liver disease. Um, we know that there's probably people over the age of 40, heavy drinkers. Um, it's a lot more common in men, liver disease. So that will help you refine your ICP. But then you're not just going to reach out to every single um, man who's over 50 who drinks because that's just going to take way too long and you're not going to be very specific when you reach out to those folks. They're probably going to ignore you. Um, instead, what you're going to do is look for the symptoms of how liver disease shows up in public. People with liver disease often have jaundice, they have slightly discolored skin, they have uh, often have lower back pain as well. So you're going to be looking for signs of those symptoms. And the same way in sales, you're going to be looking for symptoms that people might be facing the challenges and problems that you can help solve. That might mean that they're using a certain technology, or they've had some layoffs, or they're growing their team, or... Um, they've just launched a new product or they have some negative reviews online about them, right? Things that your product or service help can help solve. And then you're gonna use those symptoms to develop a hypothesis that you're gonna to bring to the customer and reach out to them and say something like this. Hey, customer, couldn't help but notice that it looks like, you know, you've had some layoffs lately. A lot of teams who have had layoffs, I'm gonna use an example here from my coaching student I had recently. A lot of marketing teams who have had some layoffs uh, find it hard to keep their ads running. Um, a lot of those companies have outsourced to us. We've been able to get improve their click rates, this, this, and this. Does this sound interesting? Am I along the right tracks or have you already got this covered? That's like an email example, but on a cold call, you could start like, it looks like you've had some layoffs recently. Wanted to reach out and see how you're currently managing your ads. And then you can ask some probing questions to uncover those pain points. Because if there is no problem, there is no challenge. There's no point in even booking a meeting with that customer. And they don't care about how innovative and amazing your ad agency is. What they care about is the fact that if they don't have an ad agency, they're gonna suffer in some way. So find the problems and challenges that your product can solve. Figure out who's the most likely to be facing those problems and challenges. And then look for symptoms, triggers, signs, catalysts that you can identify and reach out to people uh, about uh, that you can essentially be relevant in your messaging to say, hey, I saw this. Maybe you think this might be a problem. We have a solution. Does that sound interesting? That's the, that's the framework. And most sellers struggle with getting the idea around the fact that they shouldn't be pitching their product or service. They also struggle with like, okay, I can personalize something, but why does it matter to them? You need to be able to chat, link what you see to a challenge you can have them solve and answer that question for them. Oh, this is why you think I might not need this. And then that's how you get their attention and interest, book a meeting, and then do the whole account executive stuff, which is still being written, so. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that breakdown. That was awesome. Was that good? I yeah. don't know. I just felt like I just ranted. No, no, I think that was perfect. I think the only thing there is then just like activity, right? Like do all that times a yeah. hundred, right? Yeah. And and you can scale that as well. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I have to research every prospect I reach out to for 20 minutes. Nah, that's not efficient. You can find like, if you know what those traits are of people who are more likely going to need your solution, find a way to identify them en masse in a way. 
So if I can go on LinkedIn and find 20 different companies whose marketing teams are headcount has gone down by more than 30%, well, then I can reach out to all 20 of those people, with, um, all 20 of those marketing leaders with very similar messaging saying, hey, looks like you had some layoffs. A lot of folks struggled to keep their ads alive when they let, when they have reduced headcount. Boom. My message is now relevant to 20 people and I can do that, you know, a lot. Perfect. So. Well, uh, I know we're getting short on time here. I want to leave with one last question for you. Um, so we... We just went into the new year. It's now 2024. Uh, everybody's making their their resolutions, uh, but resolutions and goals are kind of just um, you know things on paper, right? So, yeah. This year, what is your main focus? And to get a little deeper here, what who who do you want Will Aitken to be? Right? Like who do you want? What do you want people to think of when they hear your name? Um, and what do you want to be like known for and accomplish? Ooh. Nick, you're getting in my soul here, man. You could give me some therapy right now. Um, can you tell by the fact I didn't respond immediately? I haven't thought about that that much. <laughs> if I'm honest, um, I've never been as intentional as I should be with my goal setting and where I want to go. A lot of where I've ended up now is just luck, just doing the right things, the right ingredients. Or at least I feel it's luck. I think luck increases the more you do something at a good level, but yeah. Um, I think by the end of this year, I, I would like to be more established um, as as someone who who's who's not full of shit, who's not doing what we mentioned earlier, who's not just ripping off other people. I want to I want to be successful, but the right way. Mm. I want to I want to do it in a way that's different, but not crap. I just, there's, there's so many folks who I could aspire. Like I could say, oh, that person's my role model, but there's so many people who are doing it worse. Right. And I don't want to be, end up going into the latter camp. Mm. Um, so I want to help as many people just, people just go, yo, this guy's cool. It's funny. He, he, he's awesome. I trust him. And I would like to have him at my 2025 sales kickoff to talk about something funny motivational or helpful i don't know but um in the meantime i, I want to focus on just being happy love my family it's been great not being a full-time employee because i've had that flexibility earlier on i i tiled my fireplace you know i didn't have to worry about it because i've got enough sales and customers now and it's just uh i'm, I'm much happier now than i have been in a long time mm -hmm. so i think start there be happy make sure my kids are happy make sure my wife's happy make sure i'm doing the things that um I'm going to lead to long-term uh, fulfillment. I love it. That's great. Uh, anything you want to leave us with? Uh, anything you want to plug here at the end? No, I hate plugging stuff. Just Nick. plug it. Just Look, do if, it. <laughs> if, you, if you liked what I said, go, you know, you know what? Go subscribe to Sales Beat on YouTube. Check out some of our videos. The most popular ones are really, really good stuff. And even the ones that didn't get any views, good stuff on that. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of the things that I built then and the things I'm still working towards building now that I'm back on it again. So subscribe to sales feed on YouTube. That's my, uh, that's my plug. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for coming on here. Will. really appreciate it. Appreciate you, Nick. Great questions.